What happens in the spirit world when you sleep with someone? 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. A lot of believers, both old and young, find themselves suffering under the oppression of the devil and the weight of a promiscuous life. The Bible explains to us clearly there is a grave price to pay for the sin of fornication and adultery. The Bible instructs so clearly about these two issues. Exodus 20.14 Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is a command. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. But we are living in a world that is normalizing it. Some even try to justify and normalize it, under the guise of, it is not a big deal anymore. But even in a changing world, the foundation of God standeth sure. Jude 1, 4 For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you tell yourself that it is okay, everything is fine, and it will phase out. But listen to me, O ye believer. It doesn't. Nobody outgrows an untamed sexual drive orchestrated by the devil to destroy them. It doesn't just phase out because you want it to. As a matter of fact, the deeper you go, the more you will continue to be sunken into its terrible claws. The originator of marriage is God himself. And one of the reasons he established the institution is for the sexual needs and urges of a man and his wife. Sexual intimacy is to be between a man and his wife within the confines of marriage, not a fun activity between two people who want to quench their momentary desires. 1 Corinthians 7.2 What most people, however, do not know is that laying with someone who they are not covenanted with in marriage comes with so much more than the five minutes fun they crave to have. So. What happens when you sleep with someone? You both exchange different things in the spirit. During intercourse, it is not only a physical things that are occurring, but something is going on in the spirit that most people don't even realize. There is a spiritual transference that takes place between the two people involved. 1 Corinthians 6.16 What? Know ye not that ye which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. You are joining yourself with that person in the spirit. You are literally saying in the spirit world, we are one. What spirits belong to them and affect them now have a gateway door into your life. Have you ever noticed two people who are involved in fornication and their relationship is so bad and is so negative and you ask yourself, why don't they just go their separate ways? They want to leave, but they can't. It's not that simple. There is a connection between the two of them that transcends the physical, that transcends any other platonic relationship. There is a connection between them that transcends nature, that even transcended this world. Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. In other words, these two people are married in the unseen world. This is really astonishing to me because I wonder how many people are quote-unquote single. The relationship status in this world is single, but in the spirit, they have six husbands or eight wives? Fornication builds a spiritual connection between people. Why do you think breakups are so difficult? When the relationship ends, you feel so lost as if something has been taken away from you. But the truth is, something has. A part of you has gone with that person, and a part of you is with that person. These same people can lose communication with one another for three years, and the moment they receive a text message from their ex, their heart sinks or skips a beat. Why? Because they have become one flesh. You hear the line, time heals everything? No, it doesn't. Time does not fix the things of the spirit. So, three, four, Five years can pass and you are still struggling with this breakup. You see, this is why some marriages are in trouble. This is why you see some wives are not satisfied in their marriages, because their husband's spirit is in competition with all the other spirits of the other men in their past. A husband will be competing with all the other guys you have become one with in the past. 
Here, you see poor Johnny competing with Roger, Tom, Russell, Philip, and Cameron. And the same can be said for husbands. This is why you see some husbands are not satisfied in their marriages, because their wives' spirit is in competition with all the other spirits of the other women of the husband's past. Your wife will have to compete in the spirit with all of these other women, Lorene, Becky, Keisha, Alicia, Emma. And the truth is that there is a war going on in some people right now. And we see people right now that they are married and they look for satisfaction outside their marriage. If you sleep around when you are single, you will find it difficult to stop when you are married. Although you are saved and you are born again, your spirit is housed in a body. Your body is not saved. Your spirit is saved and you are still living in the flesh. And the flesh remembers what you used to get up to. And the flesh will still desire to live the way that it did in the past. We give window for different kinds of spirits to come in. When you lay with strange men or women outside the will of God for your life, you open the door wide open for different spirits to come into your life and thrive, to come into your life and live. There are four effects that sexual sin has that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first effect of blatant sexual sin is that you are opening spiritual doors with another person. And more often than not, you do not know what lies behind those doors. So what does this mean? Well, when we engage in sexual sin, we engage in sin against our own bodies. Sexuality is spiritual. It was designed by God as a spiritual tie between a husband and a wife. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's what the Bible says. So, even when it is distorted, this principle still holds true. It's true for non-marital sexual behavior. When you join with another person, you are still united as one flesh, and there is a spiritual tie that is made. Listen, when you do this, you open yourself up spiritually. And the point here is that you don't know where the other person has been. You don't know what spirits they've united themselves with that are now united with you. When you lay down with them, you don't know what you're opening yourself up to. We tend to think that God was being repressive and cruel in limiting sexual behavior, when in fact, he was trying to protect us from powers and principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so the question I have is why won't we heed God's warning? So the first effect of sexual sin is that you open yourself up spiritually. Now, the second effect of sexual sin is that you are making soul ties and attachments to someone who is potentially destructive for you. In addition to the potential of taking on the spirits of multiple partners, you are also uniting yourself with people that will be destructive for your soul, your spirit, and your life in general. And oh, be careful. Be careful who you unite yourself to. One example from scripture is Ahab and Jezebel. That's in 1 Kings. Ahab was already wicked, but his union with Jezebel took his wickedness to another level. His attachment to Jezebel was extremely destructive for him and for the nation of Israel. When you tie your soul to someone, whose soul is not committed to following the ways of God, you open your soul up to corruption. Don't you know that whoever you choose to unite yourself with can have an influence on your soul? And when you're talking about sexual sin, you're talking about uniting your soul with another soul. So if you're uniting your soul with multiple other souls 
who have been uniting with multiple other souls. You now have soul ties with people who you've never even met. Multiple people you have never met. Personally, I would want to know what souls are in me. I'd prefer to have only one, as a matter of fact. We must always be on guard against those corrupting influences, and we have to guard our souls. The third effect of sexual sin is separation from God. The Apostle Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death. Ultimate death is separation from Jesus Christ. If we are actively engaging in sin, we are actively separating ourselves from God. And if we are actively separating ourselves from God, we are actively choosing to walk into death. I don't know about you, but I'd much prefer to walk into life, not death. Are a few minutes of pleasure worth an eternity of pain? Are a few casual relationships worth your eternal relationship with God? No, no. There is no greater state of being than being in the presence of God. Let us rid ourselves of the sins of the flesh and throw ourselves into the life of the Spirit. Now, the final effect of sexual sin is that your desire will take you captive. The longer you entertain it, the longer you're in it, the more you become a slave to it. Spiritual spouse or sex in the dreams. Now, first and foremost, I want to make a, um, a warning that this is heavy content and it's also for adults so if you are having children here I would not encourage you to continue to watch it because some of the things that I might share might be a little bit graphic. Now as a person who in ministry that does deliverance we came across that many times of praying for somebody who claimed to have a demon have sex with them during the night sometimes people who even have children in the spirit realm but who cannot have children in a physical who have no affection between their husband or their wife and some who cannot even get married including stories where um, a person would feel something raping them or some something has a violent sex with them not only in the sleep I remember even uh, knowing or hearing about a person an encounter where she went to the mall and something was taking control of her physical body this demon was torturing her by having sex with her in the mall and so now this may seem bizarre far-fetched for some of you like this is completely crazy but this is not new almost every person who does deliverance will tell you that they came into an encounter with somebody that they prayed for deliverance in this area now is it biblical does bible talk about let's look at, let's take a look in Isaiah chapter 34 verse 14 it says the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with jackals and the wild goat shall bleed to its companion also the night creature shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest a night creature now in your Bible if you reading that it will have a little foot a little thing on the top of that night creature and then if you look below in the footnotes it will say Lilith night creature now in most of the religions of this world they had these demons they call them incubus and succubus where this male demon or male entity that will come in the sleep and have sex with women and this female entity that will come and have sex with men seduce them sometimes steal their children and so there was a lot of myths that were going on both in Jewish culture and in other cultures but these are not myths these are realities of things that people are battling with and people are struggling with. We see that in book of Genesis chapter 6 that spiritual entities, the sons of God, and I believe like many people believe that this is not, sons of God are not necessarily the descendants of Seth, but sons of God, these, these are the angels, these are people who were part of God's divine counsel, people who were a part of God's team, God's, you know, part of the hosts. They started to come on the earth 
and they started to make love to women. They started to um, have physical relationships with women. And Jude tells us, the half-brother of Jesus tells us that because they crossed these boundaries God has set for these sons of God, these spirits, then God eventually punished them and He locked them up in the prison. Now, it's possible for evil spirits, for demonic spirits, to be able to have this kind of a sexual relationship. Spirits can take on a physical form. We see that um, angels can take on a physical form. They can walk, they can talk, they can eat, they can have their feet washed. And we see the same thing with demons is they can also take on a spiritual form. These spiritual entities would come and have sex with women and there will be an offspring that will be produced. These giants, these Nephilim that will be produced. Now this thing continues today where demons have sex with people. Now, not necessarily that physical children are produced, but they impregnate these people with spiritual perversion. They impregnate this person with spiritual confusion. The offspring of these encounters, they last through the day. Sometimes they destroy relationships, they destroy marriages, and they destroy a person's peace and ability to function. Because Satan's ultimate goal is to bring restlessness and to disconnect you from God and from other people. So in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 16 to 20, God says, if you join with my spirit, we become one. They gave the, the, the human illustration above. It says if a man uh, connects or joins himself with a harlot, him and that harlot becomes one. It gave you the physical part of the law. Then the next voice, it gave you the spiritual part of the law. So in this particular chapter 9, I did find it, it's in John chapter 17 verses 20 to 21, which is now going to add more scripture, more laws to the point I'm trying to make to you. So in John chapter 17 verses 20 to 21 says, Neither pray I for these, this is Jesus speaking, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verse 21 that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou has sent me so this is another scripture john chapter 17 verses 20 to 21 and you could correlate this uh, with first john chapter sorry first corinthians chapter 6 verses 16 to 20 both of these are showing you the laws as to how the manifestation of things from the spirit can manifest in our how it manifests in our physical realm so remember when you are asleep your physical body is at rest the your body don't know what's happening in this world but the real you your spirit the real you when you die that spirit is going to go into everlasting punishment or everlasting life that's you that's the real you what you looking in the mirror at every day is not you that is the uniform to exist here to be legal in the earth so therefore your spirit in the realm of the spirit in your dreams whatever that spirit is connecting with kissing hugging having sex whatever a covenant is being forged the key here is what type of spirit is this because the spirit needs to establish a covenant with its human host in order to manifest his will in that human host life and that's how it works all right so you must understand this because now when you see yourself in the dream having sex with someone there are many implications that come in and we're going to go into all of them tonight. There are many far-reaching consequences that comes along with that. Because primarily the people, or what appear to be people in the dream, are not people as you know them. They're familiar spirits, but not just familiar or masquerading spirit. They're also known as, but they serve a specific function. All spirits have specific functions. Be it the spirit of death, be it the spirit of poverty, be it the spirit of sickness. They have specific functions. Now, here's the key. They understand this law. They're very legalistic. They understand this. So their upper hand on us is to deal with our ignorance. So here it is, this dream. You had a dream. And in this dream, you saw 
this beautiful lady. I'm talking about guys now. And this guy began to, you begin to have sex with this lady. And you woke up and you say, no, why, why would I have a dream like that? And you never challenge it. Now, first of all, if you don't know this lady, and if you're not married in the dream, so that means you're committing fornication, right? That's a sexual sin. But what does the Bible say about sexual sins of fornication? What are the implications? See, this is now how you put the pieces together and you begin to see how this spirit brought in this nice person that you'd be attracted to. You sleep with this person, you think nothing of it. You probably enjoyed the dream and you woke up and you thought nothing of it. Now when you go through the Bible and you look at sexual laws as it relates to fornication, what does this do to the human? Because now you get to see how the spirit deceive you in the realm of the spirit to now manifest certain evils in your life. I wasn't going too fast for you. All right, I'm trying to take my time here. I'm really trying to take my time so you get a clear understanding how important it is to monitor your dreams. How important it is to recall your dreams. Because what you want to do is you don't want to find yourself ignorantly establishing covenants in your dreams. Not knowing that. And these covenants are playing out in your life. And you are so oblivious to why this is happening. You're not knowing that you, you were a co-conspirator to all of the hell that you're catching right now. So whenever anything in your Christian life, my Christian life, our Christian life, holds us hostage, it is spiritually illegal. He says, I will be mastered or controlled by nothing, including my passions. I have them, but I'm not going to let them rule me. Amen. He takes it deeper. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Because Corinthians had this problem. They had this problem. They had this sexual immorality problem. People had come out of that lifestyle and now they were in church, but that's what they knew. That's how they functioned. That's how they rolled. And they had a, they had a philosophy. Their philosophy is food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. Translation, you have an appetite. When you have an appetite and you're hungry, you go eat because you got a stomach your stomach is growling for food, so you go get the thing that's out there designed to satisfy what your stomach is crying out for in order for your stomach not to cry out for it anymore because food was made to satisfy the cry of the stomach. Because the body is crying out to re be relieved and to be satisfied, so just like the stomach cries out for food and you satisfy the stomach for food, when the body calls for sex, then you go start knocking boots. That's just what you do. They were saying that that is the natural expression of the desire. God intervenes into this discussion and he says that is not correct. He says, while food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, he says, yet your body, verse 13, is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. So your body is not for anything you want to do with it just because it's your body. And he explains why. Now God has not only raised the Lord but will also raise us up through his power. In other words, if God got Jesus up from the grave, he can get you up from the illegitimate bed because he's in the resurrections. So since he's in the resurrections, just as he got Jesus up out of the grave, he can get you out of that yielding to that legitimate passion that's being addressed in an illegitimate way. He then goes deeper. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, and the two shall be one. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him.